Hi, welcome to Winter Warmers Extreme Cozy Edition. I'm Andrea Fiorello, Head of Research and Reader Services. Today, uh, our fabulous staff are going to be talking about the best nonfiction reads that they've had this year. And I'm gonna start. Do you like to read about a complex topic delivered in a short, snappy way that still earns you points at cocktail parties? Me too. Do you wax nostalgic for science reading that has no mention of a deadly virus? Me too. Do you have a nerdy neuroscientist big brother and every few years you read a book in his field so you have something to discuss at holidays? Okay, maybe only me. But if two out of three of those things are true for you, try Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain by Lisa Feldman Barrett. Lesson number one, our brains are not designed for thinking. Brains are made to regulate the body, matching calories to energy expended or maintaining a steady temperature, not to decipher the meaning of life. Duh. Lesson number two, there is no such thing as a lizard brain, unless you are a lizard. We've all been told that lurking inside us is an ancient reptilian brain, which sometimes hijacks our fancy human brain, causing us to lose all reason. Total myth. We don't have a less evolved brain wrapped around a more evolved brain. We just have one brain, and it is actually very similar to that of every other creatures on Earth. Each animal's brain is equally evolved and tailored to its unique environment. Lessons one half and three through seven you have to read for yourself. My next choice is How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. 2020 was a year when many white Americans made reading about American racism a priority, as bestseller charts evidenced. Of the many titles out there, How to Be an Anti-Racist should be on the top of your list. Kendi is on a mission to push those of us who believe we are not racist to become something better, anti-racist, supporting ideas and policies affirming all racial groups as equal. Kendi blends memoir, history, law, science, and ethics into a clear-eyed and big-hearted book. I highly recommend this on audio. It's read by the author, who is director of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University. Kendi's knowledge, warmth, and sheer goodness came through in his voice. This inspirational read makes a great book group choice. And finally, World of Wonders, In Praise of Fireflies, Whale Sharks, and Other Astonishments by Amy Nesukamatio. This slender volume of illustrated essays was balm to my soul in this most difficult year in writings on flora, fauna, and family. Poet Nesu Kamatio invites us to stop and marvel at the fantastical world outside of human cares and ubiquitous screens. At its simplest, it's about 20 different natural phenomena, ranging from peacocks to narwhals, corpse flowers to flamingos, dragon fruit to fireflies. Fireflies or lightning bugs are one of my favorite creatures. So to give you a taste of this delightful book, I will read you an excerpt on them. What is lost when you grow up not knowing the names for different varieties of fireflies? When you don't have these words ready to pop on your tongue? Shadow ghost, sidewinder, the Florida Sprite. Mr. Mac, little gray, murky flash train, the Texas tinies, the single snappy, the treetop flashers, a July comet, the tropic traveler, Christmas lights, a slow blue, a tiny Lucy, the mischievous marsh imp, the sneaky elves, and in a tie for my personal favorite, the heebie-jeebies and the wiggle dancer. So if you're ready to open yourself to the joy of the world, read World of Wonders. And I am Suzanne Sullivan. I'm a very part-time staff member at the library and you might see me sometimes at the reference desk. And I want to talk to you about a wonderful book that helped me to stay busy for a good while early on in the pandemic. It is called Braiding Sweetgrass. It's written by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And if you too find yourself with some long empty hours with not much to do, this book may soothe and comfort you and give you a whole new way to look at the natural world. 
This is a book of essays that you can read in small bits and pieces of time, whatever your attention span will hold. And the subtitle is Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. And it is all of those things. The author is a botanist, that's a plant scientist. She's a member of the citizen Potawatomi Indian Nation. Her specialty is what we can learn from native peoples about the natural world. One chapter is called The Three Sisters. It cites the astonishing interconnectedness of corn, beans, and squash, which Native Americans, of course, have known forever. In the chapter called Maple Nation, she introduces us to the idea that we have responsibilities rather than rights in the natural world. And she explores this a bit further in another chapter, which compares the way our students do a daily Pledge of Allegiance. She compares this to the Pledge of Gratitude to Mother Earth, which is learned by Native students in the Onondaga Nation in upstate New York. I truly loved the chapter called The Epiphany of the Beans, in which she learned the secret of happiness while out picking beans. The land loves us and provides for us and teaches us to provide for ourselves. That's what good mothers do. Now, another book, a totally different sort of a book is called The Science of oh, Clean, The Science, The New Science of Skin. The author of this one is James Hamlin. Uh, it's a piece of nonfiction that will give you a great deal to think about. The author is a physician and a public health specialist, and he's famous or possibly infamous for having touted the notion that daily washing, as we know it, is probably unnecessary. However, if you can get beyond your first reflexive shock at a pronouncement like that, he has a lot of important ideas to share. And a good part of this book is given over to a history of the development and marketing of soap and cosmetics. And marketing is truly the name of the game here because uh, even though there is a huge array of soaps and detergents available for people to buy, they are all virtually the same despite a massive industry devoted to promoting them. Uh, the cosmetics industry itself comes in for some special criticism, particularly in the United States where safety standards are much more lax than in Canada or Europe. And unlike agencies in those countries, our own Food and Drug Administration has no authority to review possibly dangerous ingredients in beauty products or to false, force recalls of such products. And overall, he suggests that we would be wise to stop the overconsumption of cosmetics and antibacterial soaps, that we should go spend time in nature, enjoy our pets, worry a lot less about trying to eliminate all germs from our lives, and embrace the complexities of nature, which includes our own healthy microbes. Now, the book was published just at the start of the pandemic, and he does acknowledge this in the introduction, and he does recommend regular thorough hand washing with soap to limit the spread of the coronavirus. And now we might see what Lauren has to say. Um, the book that I'm going to talk about is called Uncanny Valley. It's by Anna Weiner. Uh, this is a memoir that I think will appeal to a lot of different types of readers. If you have any friends or family who work in the tech industry and you don't quite get the culture of their jobs, uh, this would be a great book to read. Or if you're really embedded in social media and live on the internet, um, this book provides some interesting insights. The author is a liberal arts major living in New York and she has sort of a dead end or at least slow growing job in the publishing industry. And she decides to make a career move into the tech industry. And this memoir captures her observations about the industry where she feels at times like both an insider and an outsider. Um, she rubs elbows with tech giants of the Silicon Valley and she uses pseudonyms for companies and certain people. But if you're interested, it's not hard to figure out who's who. On top of a really interesting story, the writing is excellent, which makes this a really great reading experience. Uh, next up, we have Allison. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Allison, and I'm here today to talk to you about a really big, thick book about the life of the Dalai Lama. It's called An Exceptional Life, and it's written by um, Norm Alexander Norman. It's a new book, and it's a definitive and intriguing biography about Lamo Thondop, which is the Dalai Lama's birth name. And he is known as, of course, a worldwide figure now, but the story gives insight into the prior Dalai Lamas and the discovery of the 14th precious conqueror um, from an isolated Tibetan village. You get a lot of history of Tibet, and um, he grew up as a very spoiled little precocious child. On the other hand, he was really given a lot of responsibility and um, even as a little guy, and then of course as a rebellious teenager and young man, but he grew to worldwide standing as not only a spiritual leader, but of course a political leader. Alexander Norman, who is a Tibetan scholar, offers fascinating insights into the ancient wars and political intrigue between Tibet and China. And he recounts the challenges of a child and a teenager and a young adult growing into a strong leader by sharing the Dalai Lama's astonishing spiritual practice rooted in magic, vision, and prophecy. And I did not expect to like this book. I did not expect to do anything but skim through it. And I want to tell you, it was a page turner. I really enjoyed every bit of it. And I hope you will too. And Desiree, take it away. Hello there. Um, so I'm going to talk about Vesper flights today. Um, when a novel or the latest 800 page biography is just too much to take on, a collection of nature essays like this might fit the bill. I'd read Helen MacDonald's H is for Hawk, and I was ready for more of her writing on the intersection of the natural and our emotional worlds. Vesper Flights includes 41 essays, some previously published and some new. They vary widely in length and topic. You can dip in, put it down, pick it up, and get something new and insightful with each reading, and surprising. These essays range in locale from the Empire State Building. When was the last time you read about the natural world on a skyscraper? To Hungary for a gathering of cranes, to various fields, forests, and backyards. Throughout, the writing is meditative and reflective. There are keen insights on animals and the human experiences of loss and memory. This is the kind of book that will make you reflect on your relationship with nature, and it may inspire you to head outdoors, take a fresh look and listen to the world at your feet, overhead and all around. Now I'll hand it over to Michelle. Thanks, Desiree. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk to you about a couple books. The first book that I'm going to talk to you about is called Say Nothing by Patrick Radin Keefe. It's a 2019 New York Times book of the year. In 1972, Jean McGonagall, a 38 year old mother of 10 was taken from her home in Belfast, Ireland by masked intruders. While the abduction was not expected, it did not surprise anyone. McGonagall was targeted as a tout, an inform informant for the British army. She became one of the disappeared someone who was taken away during the troubles in Northern Ireland between the years 1968 and 1998. Her body was recovered over 30 years later and her murder was never solved. Say Nothing switches back and forth between the mystery of who killed Jean McGonville and the wider history of the troubles. It's a fascinating tale of the young IRA leaders and members who carried out the Bloody Rebellion. Keefe describes the notorious Bloody Sunday Massacre and the subsequent Bloody Friday bombings, highlighting two young sisters who became provisional IRA or provost, Dolores and Marion Price. Um, and Dolores is the person that you're seeing on the cover. They became media darlings because of their good looks and their high spirits, even when pulling off deadly attacks. Keefe did extensive research on this book, including interviews with the former Irish Republican Army members, Brendan Hughes and Dolores Price, as well as using the Boston College Oral History Archive of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. This archive allowed participants to give their oral history anonymously, signing contracts that their identity would only be revealed upon their deaths. It is through the Boston College Oral History that Keefe uncovers more details regarding Jean McGonagall's death, including the possible involvement of 
um, Jerry Adams, the Republican politician who helped negotiate the Good Friday Agreement. It is where Keefe learned of the McGonville murder, and through these interviews, he comes to a conclusion about what happened to her. This is a story without heroes. It's well-written and engaging, and if you're interested in the history of the Battle of Northern Ireland, start here. My next book is entirely different. It's called Wow, No Thank You by Samantha Irby. Samantha Irby's latest book is dedicated to Wellbutrin. This should tell you everything you need to know about this memoir. She is a blogger who tells it like it is in her latest self-deprecating laugh out loud essay collection. From a night out as a 40 year old, the prep time takes longer than the actual night out. To the complexities of home ownership, Samantha offers a no holds barred look at her life. Essays include her experience moving from a large city to a small town, her love affair with her phone, and she devotes an entire chapter to her hysterectomy. She includes one on socializing with her new neighbors, which for an introvert is very hard. She is frank about her relationship with her stepkids. As long as they do not mess with the TV, she is okay with them. She has an entire chapter devoted to a 90s music mixtape detailing her love of the Dave Matthews Band. And she includes another to a series of one-liners about calling 911. To be clear, Irby's writing may not be for everyone. She can be crass. So if you don't want to read about bodily fluid or functions, this book is not for you. However, if you love a good laugh, read it. This is for fans of Jenny Lawson, Roxane Gay, Jenny Slate, and Nora Ephron. And it was on the list of best 2020 books for Time Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, and Vanity Fair. And now I'm going to turn it over to Collection Services Library Associate, Andrea Hogan. Hello everyone. The book that I'm going to talk about today is The Falcon Thief by Joshua Hammer. This is a book about obsessions, starting with Jeffrey Landrum, the titular Falcon Thief, then leading the reader to learn about the Arabian princes who spare no expense to own the winning bird for their races in the desert, and culminating with Andy Williams, the wildlife detective who is determined to bring Landrum in. This book introduced me to a subculture, subculture I never imagined existed. Oology is the study of bird eggs and eggs collecting. It was very popular during the Victorian era, but was outlawed as species of birds declined or even vanished. Unfortunately, the obsession did not. The men who collect eggs can have collections that number in the thousands. And it was incredible to read about the lengths that they go to, not only to add to their collection, but also to hide them from the world. There is something for all readers in The Falcon Thief, a resourceful villain, a dedicated detective, daredevil attempts to get the perfect egg, history, and amazing information about the peregrine falcon, one of nature's perfect hunters. All right, well, thank you for listening to our book talks. Um, we hope you found something good to read and we hope you reach out to the library and um, place holds on these books. Let us know what you're reading and uh, we'll see you next year in person.